Our next panel is all about getting closer to your audience and crafting experiences to make them stop and listen. Leading the discussion is broadcaster, journalist, actor, and musician, Mick Scarlett. Please welcome Mick and our panel to the stage. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, my first number. Um, sorry, yes, I've got to remember which job I'm doing today, because as you can tell, I am a bit of a jack of all trades, and as you will see, a master of almost none. Yes, my name is Mick Scarlett. I am a broadcaster and journalist, and today I shall be hosting this discussion with these three lovely gentlemen here. Um, as I explained to them earlier, I don't believe in um, doing my job too well, so I haven't brought many notes. Um, and I've just realised, of course, that I did need to bring my reading glasses to make sure I can see their names. Uh, so, uh, John Little, Ed Warren and Anthony Robbins, they will be introducing themselves in a moment. In keeping with the keeping it personal, I want them to introduce themselves personally. But why did I agree to do this talk? Well, because when you're a journalist, you spend your entire time looking for stories. I've worked in the media, in television especially, for over 25 years. And we spend all of our time looking for stories. And I think that now, more than ever before, that story can be got across in a way that maybe we don't like so much. Because once upon a time, we were the arbiters of what that story was. We would find you, we'd look on local papers, we'd hear from networks about someone that was sort of in keeping with the story that we wanted to tell. And then we'd find you, and we'd come and film you, or record you for radio. And then we'd edit the bit out of your story that we liked that was saying the story we thought that you should be telling. And then we'd transmit it. And then you'd watch it and go, that's not me. That's not what I said. And I know this to be true because it's happened to me a few times when I've been interviewed the other end of the camera. So why is making it personal? Why this time it's personal? Is it so important now? Well, because we finally have at our disposal the means of getting our story across precisely the way we want. Because we now have access to the means of production of media. We have the access to the means of distributing the media. And we have the ability to shape how that is done so that it fits our, well, our dialogue, our story. How we want to be perceived. And I have only recently taken up the joys of um, social media and things like that. And I have found that it is one, built a whole new career for me. I am now hired regularly and paid far more than I ever was as a journalist to say what this whole new wonderful job of what I think. It's a whole new job out there, folks. And that job is all about my personal story. It's applying the world around me, me and applying my views and my ideas to it. And so that I suppose, is something I'm very interested in about today's talk, is how do we make, how do we make that leap? Because we, whether we like it or not, exist in a world where stories are told predominantly about us. If we are an artist, if we are creative, we have something we want to get out there. And we find that we have to get that story out through the filter of the media. And so, we end up with a situation where we find ourselves having our story told and it's not always what we want. But the great thing is, if we make our story really personal, you are much more likely to find that filter reflects what you want because it tells exactly, because whether you like it or not, the things that are personal about us are what people want to know. The reason why great art, great creativity touches people is because they see themselves in it. You know, why did David Bowie strike a chord with so many generations? Because so many generations felt other. And he was the voice of the other. And so, I suppose that's why I'm here. And I won't talk too much because I'm meant to be the host. I'm not meant to be talking. It's not me you care about. So, with no further ado, I shall... Who wants to go first, folks? See, I'm used to doing this on television, and what we just do is set a camera up, then everyone would just waffle for ages, and then, like I said, we'd edit the bits out we like and throw all the rest on the floor. Well, God, that really does show how old I am, because I remember when we used to throw it on the floor. Bits of tape and a nice bit of razor blade on the floor. Um, let's go in order of uh, my piece of paper. So, John? 
Oh, you haven't you? No, that's not what I've got. So this is good. So my, my information is already wrong. I would just, who, I tell you what, Sorry, let's I, just... I'm happy to go first. Thank okay, you. you go first. Okay. Introduce yourself and away you go. Thank you. Um, okay, so I, my name's John Little. I'm a product manager at Kew Gardens. Um, I've got a couple of slides which I'll probably stand up and give you just because um, it helps to give the context on um, a mobile app that I've developed uh, with uh, Kew Gardens. Um, just to give you a bit of background about Kew, Kew is the, probably one of the oldest botanical gardens in the world. Um, it has a site at Kew in Richmond and another site at Wakehurst in Sussex. Um, so there's two locations. Um, what we've been able to do is develop an app over the last two years. Um, and yeah, I'll stand up actually and I'll just do this quickly. Sorry. So, yeah, um, develop an app. So, the, the thing that we've used, and it's something in the, over the last two years that um, you may hear, you know, you may have heard about, or, um, you know, kind of is definitely um, part of that whole internet of things, is this beacon network. So, we use an iBeacon. We haven't flooded the locations with lots and lots of beacons. Um, we use it primarily for engagement. So I'm a product manager, and I suppose you know the mantra for product management is about what problems are you trying to solve. For us, you know, we're an old institution. We have seven and a half million um, specimens. Um, a lot of them are dried specimens. Um, we have a rich history dating back 250 years, and we also have challenges in the sense that the garden at Kew is uh, 300 acres. It has 18,000 trees. It's got really poor 3G and 4G. Um, it's got flaky Wi-Fi um, in, in certain zones. And actually, beacons could be the mechanism or is providing the mechanism through which we can tell our story. Um, you know, that story could be about the science. So for us, it was about trying to get science into the garden. Um, a big challenge for us because we have, you know, 350 scientists working at Kew. Um, and we've used this lightweight infrastructure called iBeacon. Now, iBeacon um, is uh, a network, you know, it's, a, it's basically a, a structure that works for both Android and iOS. So we've just launched our Android app. We've had an iOS app out for a year. Um, and actually, the, the, the soft, you know, the, the, the thing that sits behind it is relatively simple. And we've been able to get that off the ground quite quickly and relatively cheaply. So I just want to tell you a bit about that. Um, the experience is all about when your phone basically hears this beacon. The beacon is always transmitting. And as I say, it's part of that kind of internet of things in the sense that we've got um, sensors and the, you know, the world f from where we are now is um, full of sensors in the sense that those sensors could be used to just collect what's going on, you know, track where, where people go in the garden, find out where people are dwelling, and then produce an experience based on where they are, their location, or you can do things like get people in a certain zone. So for instance, 70 yards away from that tree there, which is 200 years old, um, we can tell you a bit about the species, tell you a bit about the Latin name, give you a bit of history. As you get nearer, we can give you a video which shows you it flowering. It may only flower once every 40 years. So it's about context. We can provide information to you that is relevant to you. So um, we're not about selling. I think you know one of the guys earlier asked about, you know, are you are you selling or are you kind of doing things for engagement? Or I, I you know I kind of sh shyly put my hand up to say actually I'm not selling anything. I'm actually providing information. Um, so from that point of view, it's quite nice. You know the pressure's off from that side. Um, and then interaction three, which is not where we're at at the moment, but I think that's the key thing for us is around. At the moment, at Q, we've done the proximity thing for a year. We get where you are, and we can interact with you. But I think 2016 for us could be very good around having time-based rules and also experience or um, you know kind of behaviour-based rules. So the time-based rules could be that if you come into the garden at a certain time, we can push a notice to you to say, look, get on our land train. It gives you a really good orientation of the garden. In our old app, we couldn't do that. Um, and the behaviour-based rules could be you know, if you come into the garden and you're a regular visitor, we can provide an experience based on what you've done before. Um, and I think that's how we'd like to use the infrastructure. Obviously, you've got other things going on as well. If you add to the mix that 
beacons can take temperatures, um, you know, accelerometers, um, you could have connected devices. So again, our learning remit, we have 100,000 kids coming through our schools program, we can kind of elevate that as well. So, um, you know, th there is a lot of opportunity. Just to give you a few screens on the kind of app experience, you, um, once you hit these zones, you can have video, you've got information about botanical art, so again, it's about context, it's about giving, giving, giving experience that's different. We've got a SoundCloud integration with some of our scientists talking. Um, I think this is it, really. Experience is everything. We're seeing over the last year, people scan and don't read it. Obviously, I'm not telling you anything you don't know about mobile. They worry about location services and they worry about us abusing that. So we've been very clear on privacy and the fact that everything's anonymous. Um, and obviously, we're trying to capture the user user's attentions uh, wonder moments is a big thing in the sense that um, we can try and get some of that history, some of that context across. Um, and obviously, yeah, the benefits of getting personal. There's lots and lots of benefits, which I'm sure we'll, we'll cover on our, on our panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. It's very interesting for me because obviously another thing I work in, the field I work in, is the field of access for disabled people. And this I-beam technology is, is currently being rolled out to be used for people with visual impairments to allow them to be able to guide around the city. Uh, yeah, exactly. And, and, so it's, and it's very interesting to, to see how that can be used inclusively so that people who aren't disabled can still use the same technology. We can all use that technology to allow us to know where to be, to, to know where we are, to know what we're interacting with. And, and, and so it's a very different take on personal, but it's kind of the personal in its truest form in that it's your experience of something and it's it, but it's giving you're giving me every piece of information I might need in any way that I might need it so it's it's yeah, I think at the moment, though, we're, still, we're still at that base where you know as I say we're doing the proximity thing we get where you are but there's obviously a, a, mm. there's still work to be done to to make that you know ultra personal uh, and we're we're not there at the moment but it's one of those things where you know, we're, we're quite a good use case in the sense that we've been trying to do this for two years. Um, and even, you know, the, the, the company that we're working with, the technological company, you know, the technology partner, Dot3, they're saying, look, we, we speak to big brands, we speak to big agencies, and they still don't really know what iBeacon is and how it could be used. Yeah, and what exactly. You know, so I suppose we're a good use case in, in, those, in those respects. But you can also use it for just, you know, big data as well, you know, yeah. picking up information. But I think there's that privacy thing as well. But... This is the physical web, you know, the physical web, uh, the whole thing around Google thinking that actually they want to take the app layer away. So obviously that, at the moment, the app, there's five big apps, isn't there, really? Uh, you know, if you, if you, how do you get people to download your app? That's a big problem. And I suppose that that needs to be solved going forward for it to, to, to be successful. So someone like a Facebook or someone like that deploying beacons probably would be the tipping point. Yeah, know? I think it is. That. I mean, I know from my experience that that's the way it's going, is that eventually... The use uh, of IP will actually be yeah, yeah. rolled out across the nation and across the world. If, I, if anything, because of the fact that um, the disabled community are campaigning to make it much more used because it's so beneficial for us. And, of course, it just means you all benefit too, see? That's what inclusion is all about. <laughs> <laughs> we get the ramp, but it means you can go up the ramp too. It's great. Anyway, um, so who wants to go next? Uh, I'm happy to go next. Okay, fire away. Hello everyone. Can you hear me? I was going to try and go Hello. without the microphone. I've got an actor next. But that, that might be really, I think it's because it's being recorded. Oh, uh, I see. Uh, okay. Shall we, shall we start again then? Uh, all for access. All for access. So good morning everybody. My name my name's Anthony uh, and I'm a Londoner. Uh, and uh, I'm, for me, this really is personal because my great grandfather, George, was a drayman in the brewery just down the road here in Bethnal Green. And he, he drove the beer to the breweries and delivered the beers to the pub uh, every single day. Um, and he is part of London's story. And I am part of London's story too. I am the director of uh, the Museum of London. Rather, I'm the director of communications. I just promoted myself there. I'm the director, I'm the, the director of, uh, but you know, you never know if this goes well. <laughs> I'm the Director of Communications at the Museum of London, and I wanted to tell you a little bit um, about what we have done at the Museum of London to really make a personal experience for our, for our visitors by creating 
uh, what we call the Museum in Your Pocket. It's the Street Museum um, app. Now, hands up, who's actually been to the Museum of London? Just, just, one, just one person. Uh, Akua, what was your experience when you went to the Museum of London, when you went up that roundabout? Can you remember? Okay, uh, harsh but true. Um, <laughs> 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 that was a long time ago. So there were a few hands, hands up in the, in the room. Um, and I'm going to show you a little secret about the Museum of London at the very end of this presentation. But uh, basically, we are a museum on a roundabout with a four-lane traffic way, um, a four-lane motorway underneath us. It's not an easy access. Uh, it's, it's a difficult place to get to. It's near St Paul's, but it feels like a blooming mile away. Uh, so we have a brand problem. And the reason we wanted to put, create a museum in your pocket, create a different type of museum experience, and to attract a different set of audiences was because we had a problem with the brand and people didn't really know us. The perception was that the museum was, was not known, was a little bit sort of uncool, was a bit community, was a bit like the sort of the Islington Museum. And hopefully we are changing those perceptions. Now, can anyone guess what that smoking stack is there behind St. Paul's Cathedral back in 1976? Tate. It's the Tate. It's the Tate. So it's the Bankside, the Bankside Power Station. There's our museum on a roundabout, far fewer cars there. But when, when, museums were, when our museum was created in 76, a great sort of post-war plan, we all had very different views of what we wanted from a museum. In those days, the curator and the, and the museum visitor were, were, were far away. We, we people in museums told you what you wanted. But now, of course... All of our visitors, like all of you, are like social magpies, and you want to create your own, you want to create your own, your, your own uh, content. And what we're being told, and I read in the Washington Post this weekend, is that all of us are seeking out experiences. I've, I've got enough stuff. Give me an experience, is what it said in the, in the Washington Post. And I thought that was true until I walked past Primark this morning and saw people <laughs> running out with bags and bags of, uh, bags and bags of rubbish. So how... <laughs> So how do we do that? An earlier speaker um, talked about, um, uh, sir, I, what did he say? Sir, I know my audience and I, and, I, and I deliver to them or I meet their needs. And that's exactly the same for us. That's what we have to do. We have an exhibition on at the, the, the moment, the Crime Museum Uncovered. It's a secret museum of Scotland Yard on for the first time for the people of London to see. And we've thought about how to really make this experiential by getting into the shoes of our customers knowing who they are, all of our visitors, but particularly thinking about a sort of leading audience of creative East End types like yourselves. Very, very important for us to know our audience and to deliver their needs. And what you're all telling us is that you, you seek experiences. Here we have secret cinema, getting lost into a film. You know, the boundaries between the performers and the actors, much closer, disappearing almost. And here we have a woman in our museum experiencing what it's like to be in a debtor's prison in the, in the 18th century, actually being there, smelling it, feeling it, sensing it. How do we take our content onto the streets of London? When we had our Sherlock Holmes exhibition, we had a little exhibition here in Cheney's The Shoe Shop. And no, I didn't get these shoes for free. So we created this. We created Street Museum. It's an app using augmented reality, and it unites... Uh, now about 400 of our images with real-time London locations. It's a free app. You can download it now. And you can see what Soho, Old Compton Street, would have looked like back in the 1950s. Here we have, uh, here we have two guys walking up uh, towards past P Patisserie Valerie, and there superimposes an image of what it looked like back in the day. Here we have just over the road from Eros Piccadilly Circus, and we have a, a soldier returning, from, uh, re returning on leave during World War II, having his boat boots cleaned. So fantastic. Uh, you can really sense what it was like to be there back in the day. You don't have to come to our museum. You know, museum's boring. I don't want to go to a museum. Dusty curators, dusty exhibitions, dusty glass cases. I want a museum in my pocket, and I want to have a museum experience that I can have for one or two seconds. And it becomes personal. Look at this, this poor unfortunate woman. She's just been to Primark uh, she, in, uh, in, in, in 2014, and she walks without knowing it. 
into the night of the 29th of December 19, 1940, one of the worst nights of World War II. So this is interesting for us. It's a way of sharing our content and sharing quite uh, tough content, but also fun content. We, ha we now have a new app, Street Museum Londinian, that allows you to dig up Roman remains from the, from the city. Why is this important to us? Well, it's important to us because it allows us to both preserve our collections and share them. Uh, yesterday, I got into a lift with a group of... Um, uh, a group of French students. French students are very, very tough on our collections, particularly when they come around in school groups. And they were, uh, I, I got into the lift, and they were absolutely going mad, these kids, absolutely going mad. I was in the lift, I was terrified. And there were two women, young women, and I, I thought, I'm a director, I've got to do something. So I said to one of the young women, I said, oh, don't, don't worry, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'm, I'm a director here, I'll, I'll do something about this, I'll, I'll get their teachers. And this young woman pulled out a cigarette, and she goes, we are their teachers. <laughs> So this enables us to, to preserve our content and preserve our content for the future. Fun things, even these Roman, this 1,000-year-old uh, pair of Roman knickers can be preserved and shared using our, using our Street Museum app. So that's it. I just wanted to share one thing with you, a little secret. The Museum of London is on the move, uh, and we are going to open up this museum in 2021, which is the old Smithfield Fruit and Vegetable Market in West Smithfield. Here it is. Uh, this is going to be the new Museum of London in 2021. So I'd love your thoughts about how we can animate that museum, how, can w how we can make that work, and how we can make that content personal. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. It's funny, isn't it? Because when you say personal, and when I agreed to do the personal thing, I didn't quite mean this way around personal, but it's actually really interesting for me because so far both speakers have actually talked about using technology to make an experience personal to each of us. But actually to do that, you've still got to think about what it is that you're doing and what it is that you offer that, make, that is specific to you. What, what is your personal thing? What makes the Museum of London different from Q? Other than, of course, there's probably a lot more trees in Kew than there is in the Museum of London. But it's that, and that's kind of what I meant at the start, is it's thinking about your, your ISP, what makes you special, what makes you different. And then, how do you get that across? And so, with that in mind, I'll hand over to my last speaker to introduce themselves. And Have you got a slideshow too? I do. Well, hey, it's slideshow frenzy. Now I feel let down that I didn't bring one. You shouldn't have encouraged us, should you? Yeah. So. <laughs> Hello everyone, can you hear me? Uh, my name's Ed Warren, I'm one of the founding partners of a company called Creature London, which is just around the corner. And it makes me feel a bit intimidated being on stage with a, uh, a garden that is 250 years old and a museum that is older than I am, because we've been around for about four and a half years. Um, and there are only 50 of us, and we're tiny. But we, my agency is called Creature of London, and we were set up by three guys from an agency called Mother, and a guy from a digital agency called Glue. And I suppose what, what I want to do is just first introduce the kind of stuff that we do and then talk about this really big term of personal. Because as I think we've illustrated already, there are lots and lots of different ways that you can interpret it and, and use it, I think, when it comes to engaging with people. Um, so when we set up Creature, what we wanted to do was create a creative company. I suppose within the creative industries, there are two ways that you can make money. You can sell time or you can sell stuff. And agencies are very used to selling time, working in agency to another thing and as a consultant. And we were very experienced in that. But what we also wanted to do was kind of use, I suppose, the thinking patterns that we've picked up through our careers in advertising to figure out well, how do we actually make stuff for ourselves as well. So. You know, from clients like Carling, like Anchor, like Gatwick, like Adidas, like Tetley, like Jordans, um, and so on and so forth. We've also, perhaps foolishly, been, been trying to figure out how you just make things that people want to spend time with. Um, so we've made music videos, we've produced events, we've done plays. Um, we're putting on a music festival in Scarborough this summer, which is going to be exciting. Um, and I suppose one of the big questions that you wrestle with, with you know, whether that's developing advertising or marketing communications, or whether that's just developing things that you want people to spend time with, 
is how do I make it relevant to people? How do I make it personal? And I suppose within the world of advertising, and particularly you know, coming from a big above-the-line agency background rather than a digital agency background, the way that TV ads and print ads and traditional forms of advertising have tried to forge a personal connection is through insight and being relevant. But now, and perhaps always, we're able to kind of actually talk directly in some way to the people, to our audiences, to the people who we want to talk to. So, I think there are kind of two interesting ways in as, as big headers for how you can make things personal. But one is about how do you allow your audience to customize their own experience, rather than saying, this is what you are going to see and it's going to be the same for everybody. So we developed a show well, it ran last year, but it was about three years in the development, um, called Alice's Adventures Underground, which was an adaptation of Alice in Wonderland, which went on in the vaults underneath Waterloo Station. And we did that with a, alongside a theatre company called Les Enfants Terribles, and we were involved all the way through from conception of the idea to developing how it was actually going to work, to creating the marketing materials, and so on and so forth. But what was interesting about that show was it was immersive, which is a you know, buzzword in the world of theatre, but we were interested in finding the sweet spot between your sort of punch drunk, fully immersive, there is no clear narrative, you wander around and you find it yourself, and more traditional forms of theatre where you're told a story. Alice is the perfect text to kind of play with in that space because it is a slightly surreal journey through a series of spaces. So what we did is we decided that we were going to only send the audience in in groups of 52, a number of cards in a playing deck, and then divide them into suits. And every suit would have a totally different experience and see a totally different show and be able to kind of customize and personalize what they took out of it. And it was interesting, you know, that diagram up at the top of that screen is one third of the beginning of the map of the show of where people came together and who, who went where and where, where they went who and when they crossed and, and so on and so forth. And then from a a stage management point of view, it was insane. I mean, a, a talk about biting off more than you can chew. But what was fascinating about it was that in the bar afterwards, when people realized that they hadn't all seen the same thing, that some of them had seen the mock turtle and some of them hadn't, and some of them had met the uh, caterpillar and some of them hadn't, that what it felt like to us was that what that gave them was a sense of uniqueness. The show I saw was mine, and no one else saw, saw it in quite the way that I saw it. In the world of... Um, is that working? Why is it over there? Um, in the world of marketing, obviously, brands are kind of obsessed with getting personal with their audiences because the more personal you can get, the more your audience will like you or, or feel close to you. If you address them directly, they will like you more. The problem being is that it's bloody hard for brands, particularly brands that have been around for a long time, to figure out how to do this because they're so ingrained into a vertical conversation with their consumer, where from on high, they transmit a message through a media to their consumer. Whereas now I think horizontal conversations are becoming more and more possible. You can talk directly to many, many people, either through the use of data or through just platforms. So I think Zappos is a fascinating example in terms of getting it right when it comes to keeping it personal because they go to great lengths to use social media, not as a marketing tool, but as a business tool to talk directly to their customers. So that, happy birthday, I wish I could make it tonight, have fun, that's a personal interaction. Whereas, here's my slightly creepy Amazon recommendations <laughs> from the algorithm, can feel less personal, because it still is mediated. I mean, it's interesting, you compare the success of Coca-Cola by producing named bottles, which in a very sort of simple way made your interaction with Coca-Cola feel personal in a way that it perhaps hadn't before, to Starbucks, who you know, are desperately trying to get a personal connection with their customers, <laughs> but, but frequently get it wrong. Um, I mean, literally wrong in that case. But, but I suppose that, that's one of the things that I'm interested in talking about is, is how hard it can be for large organizations or large brands to get personal without getting creepy. Because that, that is, I think, particularly as we go into programmatic advertising and big data and all the rest of it, it can get really, really minority report creepy if you're not careful. That, that's me. Thank you. 
thank you. I, I must admit that my wife and I went to Alice Underground. In fact, we were the first, we got invited to make sure that the wheelchair access was great, and it was very good, so bravo. Um, and then I went around telling all my friends that were in wheelchairs, you've got to go because you get to see the mock tail, um, which, which was absolutely stunning. And it really, it's quite funny because you are exactly right. It was a very personal experience. Although it wasn't, as you said, one of those ones where it's kind of, it's your personal experience because you've made it up, mate. You know, this was a proper piece of theatre but that you all came away really excited by. Um, I think that's a really interesting point in that you have to find the sweet spot between total personalisation and you know, telling people a story. You know, whether that story is a story that you're telling in a museum or in a garden or in an advert, um, people still like being told stories. And, and the level of effort that deep personalization can require from your audience can make it tricky. You know, there's a reason why choose your own adventure books aren't at the top of, of literary lists every year is because we still like being told stories and we still like being an audience and, and sharing in a, a shared story as opposed to everything having to be totally tailored to us. Because that, that's something that's very interesting to me in that you know, when I came to this discussion, I was thinking about how you use your own personal experience to make whatever you're doing appeal to a wider audience. And it's almost like you flipped it on the head and you've all said, well, what you do to appeal to a wider audience is actually personalise what you're doing, if you see what I mean. So I'm, I, I, and, I, and I think it's very interesting. How do you all decide what it is about what you're doing that is the, 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 that element that becomes personal. You know, how do you decide what parts of your museum, what parts of Kew Gardens are of interest? What, what's that jumping off point? I, I think it's about listening, listening to the customer. I mean, certainly for the Museum of London, uh, you know, London is, is our story. London is your story. So you are all part of the story. So that is something that's unique for us. I love the Natural History Museum, but I don't really feel part of the story. Possibly someone of my generation feels part of the story when I go to the Imperial War Museum. You probably don't, because I think you're all a bit younger than me. Um, but I think it is about sort of listening to, listening to the customer, being receptive. And I think it's very much about having a, a two-way dialogue. And I'm sure this, it's the same for, for, for all of us now. You know, gone are the days when curators or horticulturists or theatre directors or whoever they were could sort of tell people what, what for. Because, because if, you do, if you do and they don't like it, you're sure going to hear about it the next day, aren't you, on TripAdvisor or on, or on Twitter or on Facebook or, or whatever. So I think it is about, about listening and, and being humble and, uh, and recognising that, you know, you're only, you're only part of telling that story. You know, your, your customers, your visitors are, are really what it's all about. So um, it's, it's their story too. And I think from, you know, from the point of view of, um, you know, there's the push and then there's the pull in the sense that now there's the infrastructure to take, a, you know, a story back from a visitor or, or a user, who, you know, whatever language you want to use. But, um, you know, there's a lot done around who your audiences are. You know, we know that there's 1.3 million people coming to queue. We know that, you know, we know some of them are interested in technology a lot of them want to put their mobile away and walk around for a couple of hours. So, that, so internally, that was a big thing for me. You know, I was trying to say, actually, this app will give them enough you know, to actually make them look up and appreciate their surrounding, you know, rather than all oh, head buried down in an app walking around for four hours. So, um, and that's a, that's a tough internal conversation to have, really, because I think people were you know, thinking, you know, that, do, we, do we need an app? We've got a responsive website and things like that. So... Um, I think, yeah, there's definitely the, 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 the mechanism now, the infrastructure is there to, to take information back. So, you know, you could add a social layer to that. You know, if you, if you take a stunning backdrop of, of the Palm House, which people do and they put on our, you know, uh, different social media feeds, wouldn't it be lovely if you could, you know, you can pin it now to, you know, to a beacon and you could kind of look through that and you could see that kind of content from other people. Uh, you know, again, it's not something we're doing at the moment, but it's all, you know, it's something that I think could could be prevalent as we go forward as, as it gets easier to do that, you know, so, um, yeah. Um, I mean, both of my illustrious other speakers on, on stage are, are lucky in that people choose to go to the Museum of London and people choose to go to Kew Gardens and they've chosen to do it. Often, particularly in the world of marketing, you're interrupting and, and you need to earn that interruption in some way. 
And I think that um, when it comes to personalized elements within a campaign or within a brand's behavior, they probably, A, should be elements rather than the totality of it, much as Amazon may wish it were otherwise. Um, and I think they kind of fall into three categories. I think you can give people toys, you can give them gifts, or you can give them tools. And, and all of those things can be personalized. So you know, for Adidas, we made a uh, Facebook app that sat alongside a TV ad which represented your confidence as a giant glowing animal that surrounded you when you put on a pair of trainers. Yep, um, and, and the app allowed you to, to would, it would conjure your own spirit animal if, as, once you looked into the camera and it recognized your face. And, and again, that, that's a toy. All that, all that is is a, a diversion for 20 seconds, 30 seconds um, for someone who's interested in Adidas and it's building a, a deeper connection with them by placing them into the story that we're telling. Whereas something like uh, Nike ID, that's a gift from Nike saying we, you can make your own trainers exactly how you want to make them. Whereas I think the, the Museum of London app, which is a fabulous, if you haven't got it, do download it, it is fabulous. That, that's, I see that almost as a, as a tool, because if, if you can get that behavior of going, I'm standing right here now, I wonder whether there is you know, a window into the past in, on my street, on my commute, whatever it is. So that, that's, I think, the way when, when we're thinking about personalization at Creature, we often start with toys, tools, or gifts as ways in. I think you describe my, my app better than I but better than I did actually. But I think you're absolutely right about the fact that we've got the medium now. So there's no excuse for not knowing our not understanding our audience. I heard a lovely story that the outgoing director of the um, British Museum, Neil McGregor, when he took on that job about ten years ago, he had jo he had been the director of the National Portrait Gallery, and he thought, right, I'm going to spend a whole week on the front desk learning about my visitors. So he did that. He spent two days de de redirecting people to, uh, to um, Harrods. He spent the next two days telling people there were no dinosaurs there. And on his final day, on the Friday, there was this elderly lady, very, very posh elderly lady, and she was wandering up and down, looking really concerned at him. And uh, eventually she came up to him and she said, um, is everything all right? And he goes, yes, madam, how, how can I help you? She said, are you, are you Neil McGregor? He said, yes, madam. And he, the lady looked at him, she goes, are you all right, dear? Because you used to be the director of the National Portrait Gallery. <laughs> now we've got the tools. Because this is one of the interesting things, isn't it? I mean, when you were saying about toys, I remember, um, what was the little mouse? Sorry, I'm talking to my wife here. The Aero Mouse. Anyone, anyone as old as me remembers when computers were, you know, Windows 95, and you could download this little, tiny little bit of code, and then suddenly, while you were working on your computer, a small animated mouse would walk across the front of your screen, do a little dance, and then walk off and disappear. It did nothing, but it was in keeping with an advert on the, t on the television at the time where a mouse was associated with Aero, and that was it. And you were meant to just think, oh, I fancy an Aero. Um, it was an awful piece of technology. It, you know, you always worried about the fact that it, what it was going to do to your code because you know Windows wasn't the most stable thing back then, as if it is now. Um, but that's the great thing is that technology is advancing at such a state rate. What do you think the future is for technology? Do do you think that that it's going to remain phone based? Um. I, was, uh, I went with the uh, Department of Trade and Industry and the IPA to the West Coast a couple of weeks ago to meet with a whole bunch of companies out there, and it was a very interesting trip. And one of the people who we met with was a company called the Mobile Majority, who were at the kind of cutting edge of programmatic advertising and, and long bezier strings of um, if this, then this, then this, then this, and then we serve you an ad that's totally, totally tailored to you. Um, and now that they have, you know, the amount of data that is possible to scrape is only increasing exponentially for every single one of us. I mean, whether or not you are a regular user of social media, everyone knows quite a lot about you if, if they want to. And I suppose that this for me is where I think brands in particular, where you have that unasked for, unearned interruption, have to be really, really careful. Because it's now possible for me to, to persuade a client that I should geo, we could geofence every single pub in the UK. We could, when a potential Carling drinker walks into it, we'll know his name, where, you know, what his Facebook, the data we can scrape from Facebook, which other pubs he's been into previously, what, what cookies he's got, and we could serve him creepily personalized messages. 
but, but I think you have to earn that level of interaction, particularly if you're a brand. You, if you, there was an article many years ago now when TiVo was first launched, and TiVo was trying to predict what you would like to watch and would record things for you, which was, my TiVo thinks I'm gay. Because that, that, uh, this poor chap's TiVo had decided on the basis of, of the data that it had to make a bunch of choices that weren't at all suitable for him. And we, we've all had that experience with the kind of the uncanny valley version of personalization where Amazon nearly knows you and nearly gets it right, but in recommending things that aren't quite appropriate for you, simply proves that it's a, ro a robot. And that actually, if what you're after is deeper connection through personalization, that can be more distancing than if they just spoke to you generally. See, this is my thing. As a journalist and as a creative, this is my big worry. I was listening to the discussion earlier, and everyone was going on about, you know, lots of the content online during the, para the Olympics and the Paralympics was created by robots, and this was disgusting, and I'm going back to my union to make a protest about this, because I think that this is one of the issues that, for people that are at the creative face of um, this, te you know, this technology, is kind of coming along and, and saying, well, we don't need you anymore. And I think that there is a human element required. You know, you're right, my Amazon um, suggestions are always the most bizarre thing. I bought um, a gardening chair for my mother at Christmas, and I now cannot stop being told what gardening equipment I need. Um, uh, and, and, and it's just never-ending. It's like, I only bought one thing. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't want it all. I, there's not a pattern there. One thing does not make a pattern. I mean, if it was, it would just be boots, because that's all I ever buy from Amazon. He says wearing his new boots. Um, right, I, I, don't, I think I might... Is anyone, has anyone got any questions about personalisation? No. Because it's a funny one, isn't it? Because it's, it's using the technology that's available to make your product appeal to people. But one of the things I was quite interested in is how do you, I suppose it's a bit different, but especially for, for, you, for you, is that what is it about something that you think appeals to people? Okay, I, mean, I think it's a really interesting question and kind of the unasked one, which is to go, why does personalization appeal? Why, why does anyone care? Um, and you know, if, if I get sent a message that says, dear Ed versus dear customer, why does that make me feel better? Um, and I suppose, um, I think at its heart is, is the idea that, that if I'm addressed personally by an organization, by a brand, by another person, what that does is it, is it confirms for me my uniqueness. It's, it's a really deep human thing. To, to have someone feel, whether that's automated or not, to feel like they know you in some way, um, is, is very profound and very, very powerful. Um, I mean, it's, it's, been, it's interesting to talk to organizations like Facebook, organizations like Google and all the rest of it who are doing huge things in the world of advertising to make it more personal, to filter ads so that they are specific to you, that they address you directly, that they know that you're obsessed by gardening. Um, but, and from Google and Facebook's perspective, having spoken to them, that, that's a huge benefit to the end user. It says, well, I'm only going to see advertising. I will never need to see a tampon ad again because it's not relevant to me. But I wonder <laughs> whether, and until that technology gets so good that it genuinely feels human, the difference between Zappos having a human use technology as a platform to have a personal interaction with a much wider group of people versus an algorithm having an interaction with me that is mock personal, there's still a big uncanny valley. Yeah, how many people are, are, work in some kind of marketing field? Cool. And how many people are, are creative and actually make something and want to know how to get that out into the world? Yes, because I think this is the big dichotomy. I know when I said yes to doing this, I thought it was much more about how to make your personal story get out there and not how to make us all feel like we're being talked to personally when actually it's a bloody robot. Right? Because I personally think, oh, that's horrible. I hate it. I hate being talked to by computers as if I'm a... I don't want... It, I don't, it's a computer. Talk to me like a computer. I want R2-D2. I don't want bloody C-3PO. Right? I want my robots to be robots. And so I kind of find this whole thing a bit scary. Not because of, oh, they're going to take over the world, although I would quite like that, because I'm a big fan of the Daleks and the Cybermen. So, you know, let's go for it. I mean, I would be into Daleks, wouldn't I? Come on. Until they flew... They were all right until they flew. 
Then it was just, that's cheating. <laughs> Better bloody computer came up with that idea as well. Because I suppose, I mean, in some ways, like, we all talk about personalization as if it's a brand new thing. And suddenly technology has unlocked this ability to talk personally to people, where, of course, you go back really not very far, and you don't need to go back at all. And being able, you know, the shop assistant in Gap who is pleasant to me and strikes up a conversation is far more likely to get my business than the person who doesn't. And that, that's just human, again. So, so for me, it's really interesting. And in, in actually, I think it's not about technology doing brand new things. It's about technology unlocking uh, yeah. more human I things. I think um, the best example at Q, the best personalization we do at Q is um, just talk to one of our volunteers because um, that is, uh, you know, they, they do tours. You can come in and they take 15 people around. Uh, you know, personally, I don't think an app can compete with that kind of personalization. The problem is it doesn't scale very well in the sense that you can only take 15 people around. So, um, you know, that's part of the testing that we were doing, which is, you know, would, would the volunteers feel comfortable about recommending the app to people? You know, did they feel that, you know, it wasn't doing, taking away the content that they produce themselves and, and, and you know, t take people on this personal tour? Um, so I think, yeah, there is a, the, yeah, the, I, I totally agree in that sense. Um, but it's just, you know, you have to get the balance because there's a lot of talk, isn't there, around brands. And, and obviously you would know a lot more about that than me, but, um, you know, dealing with brands. But that omni-channel thing, you know, which is, can you take my browsing history and, and, and you know, when I'm actually in uh, one of these stores, can you make it frictionless? Can you make it meaningful to me? And obviously we're, 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 we're a long way off that. But, you know, obviously I think that, like you were saying before, the, the infrastructure's there, but I don't necessarily know if, ro if the robots are going to be able to, you know, get that completely. It needs some kind of interpretation. It needs some kind of, uh, you know, it needs some thought and some application around it uh, on each of those experiences, really. Because something that uh, occurs to me is that what this is doing is it's shrinking our ability to have new experiences. Because what we're doing is we're being told by something else what we might want to see. Uh, music is a perfect example. If you download, you know, once upon a time you discovered music in all different manners. Now if you get, a, or we recommend this, right? If you listen to my playlists, they are almost all electronic. They are all stuck between 1979 and 1983 to five, and they all have men with eyeliner on, basically. Um, but I have a much broader music taste than that. But I don't play that so much. So how do you, how do you get, what, what, techniques do you use to go, well, this is what you seem to like, but have you thought of trying this thing that's nothing like what you like? Um, yeah, I'd like to say it was scientific, but uh, some of it is trial and error. You know, you, you do have to just put things it's out It's got there. a random algorithm going, here's just a weird thing. <laughs> well, exactly, yeah. You know, here's, a, here's, a, here's an old picture of, you know, something Darwin uh, did. Um, you know, can we, can we give you a context to this? Can we, can we provide you with a bit of yeah. that information? And, and it's a bit like you were saying, you know, that is that teachable moment or that bit where you do it for a minute and you put your phone away. We're quite happy if you, you use the app for a couple of minutes, you learn something and you put it away or you, you, you know, it's, it's added to your experience because as much as you don't want to admit it, it's a competitive market. You have to pay to get into queue. So people, will, you know, vote with their feet. They, they go to the British Museum, they go a, a elsewhere. So, mm. you know, we, it's about layering on, you know, something that people can you know, like you were saying before around some of, the, some, of the, some of the work that you've been doing, which is, you know, if it's personal, people think, oh, you know, I'd like to go back there. I'd like to try, you know, I'd like to do that again because it, it's, it feels a bit, you know. Yeah, I think it's about, it's about context. It's, as you both said, it's about connection. It's about relevance to people's lives. And it's also about being able to tell that story mm -hmm. that you've both uh, expounded very, very powerfully. It's also about not letting the medium, you know, run, run away with itself and, and, and remembering the message. Uh, you, know, you talked about the sort of friendly welcome people get at Q. You saw our brutalist roundabout. We have to make sure that our, our hosts, our, you know, when, uh, when you arrive at our museum, are really friendly and really, really welcoming. And that is, that is absolutely everything. I think the problem for us now, though, of course, is our, our street museum app is now four years old. You've got beacons. We flirted with NFC, which is Near Field Communications Technology. None of you all know what that is, but you all have an um, Oyster card in your pocket, which is exactly what it is. Um, it's knowing what the next best thing is, the next biggest thing is, and how the hell you're going to afford it, because all of you are expecting more and more and more from, certainly in our case, an augmented reality app. You want to sniff it, smell it, feel it. You want to taste it. You want 
to feel the ground move un underneath you. And we've somehow got to pay for that. There, there was a series of Radio 6 trails that have been on the air fa fairly recently, and I, I think they're still using it, where they position their DJs or their guests as being better than an algorithm. Um, and I remember there was one for David Byrne doing a show where he was like, let's find out whether I'm better than an algorithm. And, and I think that that's you know, what that points, particularly in the world of music, but I think in all content, what that points out, which is fascinating, is the tension between the best for me and the best there is. Mm. So John Peel might recommend me a track that I simply never heard of, yep. but, but speaks to me and is, is a new bit of my life. Whereas the only thing an algorithm can ever do is look at existing data and extrapolate from that stuff that has already happened, essentially. And, and I think, you know, playlists in the world of music is, is the new background, and that will be the place where giant music companies live or die. Yeah. Um, but there's a big question within that, which is the, getting that balance between curation and algorithmic suggestion correct. And that, and that kind of applies, I think, across with so many different types of content. I mean, with, with a million different digital butlers in my life, from now my television, my phone, my computer, all desperately trying to recommend things that have been tailored to me in some way, getting that person, that sense of human connection of going, actually, I think you're really like this, right, is hard. Do you not think that in a way what we're doing is we're kind of ignoring the fact that people can decide and... I mean, I think it, not necessarily you guys, because I think that your product at the moment is still very much someone is in your space, experience, they've come, they've volunteered to experience your space, and they have got some piece of technology that allows them to experience it better. It's very much like you know, going to a museum and saying, yes, I'll have the headphones, press button three to hear what about this piece of art. It, 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 it's still, you're still willingly going into it. Uh, and it's just that, it's a very different thing from then having it come at you f without you asking it. But I suppose, you know, if, if there are enough decent use cases where people enjoy the experience, then they won't be, you know, to almost... Uh, there's that kind of degree of, you know, you can stop it. You can just turn your Bluetooth off, you know. So, you know, if you don't come in... If you want to stop it, you just turn your Bluetooth off for, for Q. Um, and obviously that's difficult for us because then the experience stops, you know, in that it, obviously there is still information that people get within the app and we still try and replicate some of that. So for instance, we did an audio tour using Beacons, um, a hastily arranged one really, and, uh, you know, last summer, and we're trying to iterate on that again to do something with all kids this year, in, you know, next month. So, and you learn, don't you? You learn from it, but I think that's the thing, which is people won't, you know, if, if, if Google and others have their way and they take the app layer away, because with an app, you sign up to it, don't you? You, yeah. you, you, you willingly download it and there's terms and conditions and, and you almost say, I'm, I'm going to communicate with you on these, you know, within these boundaries. Um, if you take that app layer away, then obviously, you know, the, the physical web, you know, the JC Deku street furniture can start talking to you, essentially. Um, <laughs> it does. So, uh, and, 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 and it is yeah. at the moment, yeah. But, you know, it can, but, it, but then for Q, it could be good because you can come to Waterloo and we could you know, ping you a 20% offer and say, do you want to come to Q today? It's, you know, it's raining, but actually we've got all these things going on. You know, so. people, people vote with their feet, and certainly I presented to you our successful app. I didn't present to you the uh, three or four that have disappeared completely without trace. But you know, we had to invest in and take a, and take a punt on, so that's, that's, quite, that's quite tricky. It's, it's, it's not knowing what the future is, but one thing I have learned is it's almost impossible to sort of future-proof your offer. It's funny, actually, that was going to be my next question, but that is it, isn't it, is that it's that whole, I mean, my wife is a web designer and develops apps herself, and, and it's that thing of you have to keep trying as the technology changes. Does anyone have any thoughts about where we might be going? Maybe. About can I, can I make that the last question? Yes, sure, absolutely. Yep, brilliant. Otherwise, everyone's going to be really hungry and they might... Yeah, cool. <laughs> Sorry. Well, in that case, our last question is, what do you think the future might be for personalization? Um... I think personalization will only increase um, and, and the attempts to do it will only increase and you know, algorithms will become smarter and our, the interfaces that we have to this vast sea of data will get to know us better and better and better. Because I think one of the things that personalization can do brilliantly is improve an experience. But the other thing it can do is, is help me navigate choice because the internet has been marvelous at giving us a hyper abundance of choice but that produces fatigue. Uh, and I think also 
dissatisfaction potentially because the more choice there is, the more, I'm, the more I feel I may be dissatisfied with the choice I've made, but also paralysis about what choice I should make. You know, if, I've got, if I suddenly know about the 120 different museums or gardens I could visit in London on, on my phone at all times, how do I find out which one is right for me and feel confident that I've made the right decision? And that could be a very interesting, well, it already is, but an, an interesting role for personalization, like literally having a butler to say, well, sir, I think, to be honest, I think you should be going to queue today because you're obsessed with gardening ra rather than the Museum of London. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think I totally agree. In, in a world of information overload, it, it can act as a filter, can't it? It can, it can filter the stuff that you're, you're not interested in as long as the filter or the, you know, the, the, the stuff going bottom behind the scenes is, 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 has got you and is correct. Um, and I think, you know, for the future, you know, I've got 11-year-old and 7-year-old. I, I, I do worry about, you know, the use of, uh, you know, kind of, uh, the, the, you know, digital equipment. Um, and, you know, just, just being able to, to, to try and help, help them to, to filter that as well, really. You know, it's, it's, quite, it's quite difficult, really. So, but um, I, I, I think, I think it, it, we, we can get to the stage where it, it should be seen, and you know, hopefully it will be seen as a positive and not... Oh, I'm, you know, I'm getting pinged 200, 300 times a day with di messaging that I don't want because I think people will just turn off in their droves. And don't ask me. I'm still on Friends Reunited because I find <laughs> I find I find Facebook too cutting edge. Um, but um, uh, I, I too, I asked my nephew Zachary about the next the next big thing, obviously, because I'm in my 50s now. Um, but for me, it, what would be really fantastic is stuff that enables all of you to touch and feel and experience our collection and uh, things like Blipper uh, and, and other developments being led particularly by the retail sector which would allow you to sort of toss a Roman pot into the air without doing it any damage. Absolute, absolutely wonderful. All I can say is watch this space. Well, there you go. Um, that's because we've been told time for dinner. Um, so thank you very much to my panel, uh, John Little, Ed Warren and Anthony Robbins. I'm Mick Scarlett and as you can tell I was probably the wrong person for this because I'm a complete technophobe and uh, I find all this kind of thing terrifying. Um, that's why I want to buy an island and live where there's no Wi-Fi, which would drive my wife a web designer up the wall. Anyway, with that, I say goodbye. <laughs>